Okay, cool. So Malbec. Um, Malbec, it's considered a Bordeaux grape um, because it was grown in Bordeaux, uh, but it didn't actually originate in Bordeaux. Malbec, there's a, what is it? There's a myth that, uh, I think it's a Polish, that a Polish like farmer like traveled across France and like planted Malbec all over the, the place. So there's like a Polish Johnny Appleseed, but with, uh, with Malbec. But they think that that is just a myth and that in fact, Malbec originated in Northern Burgundy at some point long ago. Um, which like I say here is a little funny to me because Malbec is like not a particularly easy grape to grow. It's a little, it's a little difficult. Um, it's uh, uh, it's not like particularly late ripening, but it's also not early ripening, and it's particularly susceptible to cold temperatures and frost. And it is thin skinned, um, so it's susceptible to like rot and mildew and downy mildew and all, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so I just, I can't imagine that it was a grape that was particularly well suited to Northern Burgundy, um, but it spread across France um, and it, uh, it was actually really common in Bordeaux. It was one of the, the Bordeaux blending grapes and um, back, oh geez, I guess like a hundred years ago and prior to that Malbec sort of fulfilled the role that uh, Merlot does now. Malbec ripened earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon. It was a little bit easier to ripen than Cabernet. Um, and so farmers would grow Malbec in addition to Cabernet Sauvignon. And particularly back then when the climate wasn't as warm as it is now, Cabernet Sauvignon was sort of difficult to ripen in a lot of Bordeaux. So, you know, you would have this like marginally ripe Cabernet Sauvignon that would have pretty robust tannin and acidity. And so then you would blend other stuff in with it to make a complete wine, fill it out, soften it. Um, and that role was fulfilled by Malbec and Cabernet Franc. Um, but because Malbec is susceptible to cold, so in 1956, there was this terribly cold winter in France and uh, there was a really bad frost and it killed a lot of Malbec vines in, um, in Bordeaux and also in Caor and the rest of the Southwest, but, but, but particularly in Bordeaux. And the Bordeaux winemakers in particular had just had enough of Malbec at that point and they uh, decided to replant with Merlot and Cabernet Franc and, and other things and stuff like that. So, uh, so Malbec basically sort of like faded away and be, you know, stopped being a common grape in Bordeaux. Somewhere, I forget, I saw like a, you know, stat of like how many thousands of hectares of Malbec there are in Bordeaux today. It's not a lot, it's like 1300 hectares or something. And, you know, out of the entire Appalachian of Bordeaux. But further inland in um, Caor, they continued growing Malbec. Uh, it was always the primary grape there. So they replanted with more Malbec and they continued making Malbec in Caor. So, uh, Ka and that really, so then Caor really became like associated with Malbec. Caor is like, uh, as far as I know, it's the only appellation that is, so Caor legally has to be 70% Malbec. Um, you can blend in Merlot, you can blend in a knot, but it's, it's primarily Malbec. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other appellations in the southwest of France that grow Malbec. Um, Madaron is another big one. Madaron is primarily a knot, so, but Madaron also grows, uh, I believe, some Malbec. And there is like Bergerac and uh, Irelegui, I think, grows Malbec. Irelegui is like down in the foothills of the Pyrenees on the way into like the Basque countryside, or I mean, it's the French Basque countryside. They grow Malbec down there, um, but it's a blending grape. Uh, Malbec is also grown in the central Loire in like 
terrain and stuff. It's uh, it's allowed in like AOC terrain rouge. Um, it's called Cope there. Oh, and I should say that in uh, in Taor Malbec it's called Oxerwa. Um, so you, it's called Oxerwa in Taor, and then in the Loire it's called Cote, and then in Bordeaux it's I guess it's called Malbec if it's called anything, or that it's just called that grape that we used to grow and we don't grow it anymore. Um, so uh, so it grows in the Loire Valley as well, it's called Cote. Um, it's primarily, I guess, been a blending grape, it feels like, but I mean, people do always also made 100% varietal Malbec in the Loire, in the area around Anjou, but they're sort of rare, um, as there is more interest in the rest of the world for wines like that, and as the climate has warmed, and so it's easier to like fully properly ripen Malbec in the Loire Valley now. I, I like I'm seeing more coat wines coming into the United States. Um, I think that they partially more are being produced, um, partially like where it might have just gone into like some kind of red blend or like rosé or something before because uh, A, there wasn't interest, B, it was too hard to ripen the grapes, um, but also just because there's more interest from people like us the French, the you know, winemakers in the Loire are bottling, shipping, and making available more coat where previously they would have just used it in some kind of red blend or rose blend, something like that. Um, but coat is uh, an important red grape in the Loire, certainly not like Cabernet Franc. Cabernet Franc is like, you know, produces world class wines in the Loire, and um, there are like great Malbecs being produced. In the Loire Valley, but uh, you'd be really hard pressed to find like wine people around the world who agree who would who would without being prompted who would be like, oh, Coat from the Loire Valley. That's one of the greatest wines in the world. Um, that's that's not not really quite not there, not on that level yet. Um, but some are really I gotta say some are really 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 exciting, and we're gonna drink one. Um, then the other big like Malbec, you know, so there's Argentina. Um, Argentina Malbec was taken to Argentina in 1868 by Michel Pujol, who was uh, contracted by a provincial governor in Argentina to take a bunch of French, to, to import vines from France to Argentina to help like modernize winemaking and grape growing in Argentina. Um, so among, I think, I don't know, among various great varieties, he brought Malbec. And Malbec just happened to be particularly well suited to Argentina, to like, uh, I don't know what to call it, high desert, subalpine, um, foothills of the Andes Mountains, you know, like Mendoza, Mendoza is a huge place. It's funny, like, you know, earlier in my wine career, I would read about like, oh, these wines from Argentina come from the foothills of the Andes Mountains. And I, in my head, I would imagine hills. Like I would think like the Longue or something in Italy, I would think hills. But actually when you look at pictures, uh, and we'll, we'll, we will get pictures um, of Mendoza, it's basically like high desert. It's, it's, most of it just looks flat. Um, it's just high elevation flat land, like plateau on the way up into the Andes. Um, so it's particularly easy to farm, you know, like if you want to do things industrially and mechanically, you can, it's totally easy to do that. And a lot of producers there do. When you look at like the average estate sizes in, um, in Argentina, in Mendoza, like estates are like a hundred acres, 200 acres. They're, they're big places because it's, it's easy to do that. Like, and there's a lot of land available and stuff. Um, and Argentina has always been like an agricultural export country. Like that's been like a prim primary, one of the primary economic activities in Argentina is like they grow a lot of food and export it to North America and Europe and you know now to Asia to China and stuff like that. And that's what Argentina has always done, which means large scale farming, you know, for export. 
Um, so high elevation, dry, very little rain, sunny, uh, soils with great drainage, but plenty of water to irrigate with because of snow melt from the Andes Mountains. Um, so it was just a super easy place to grow Argentina. Um, the grapes would get ripe easily. They would build up plenty of pigment and you could make like juicy, lush, rich red wines there really easily. And you didn't have to worry about frost because it doesn't get that cold. You didn't have to worry about mildew and rot and stuff. So, um, so Argentina and Mendoza ended up being a great place to grow Malbec. Um, so it was, it was a successful grape variety there, but it's not as productive. It doesn't produce as many like grapes or as many like kilos per hectare as um, uh, Bonarda and uh, Criola Chica, which is the same grape as Pais over in Chile and Mission up in California. So actually for a lot of winemaking history in Argentina, Malbec was there, but it wasn't a dominant or like primary grape variety. There was actually more um, Bonarda. Bonarda was the most common. I think in the handout I wrote not, that's wrong. Bonarda was the most common like grape variety in Argentina for a long time. Uh, they also grew Tanat, they grew Malbec, and um, uh, Criola Chica and things like that. And because Bonarda, Criola Chica, you can produce a lot more like kilos of grapes per hectare. And if you're producing like inexpensive jug wines, that's what you want. You want quantity over quality. Um, Malbec was a, thought was a, it is a lower yielding, more like just naturally like quality sort of wine just naturally produces fewer grapes um so it was a little less popular it wasn't until more recently like the last 40-ish years 40 50 years that um uh, as argentina started exporting more wine uh they realized that malbec was a more like marketable wine and uh Catena in particular like did a lot of experiments with malbec uh, at higher elevation in Mendoza that were successful. And uh, they're start they started to develop this following internationally for Argentine Malbec. And so then all these producers jumped on the Malbec train and started grafting over, you know, their Bonarda and stuff like that to Malbec and started producing a lot of Malbec for export, um, which is cool because like Malbec, you know, there's Kaor, like producing Malbec, but um, but that it's Kaor is a very different wine. Malbec from Kaor is a very different wine compared to Malbec from Argentina. The versions of Argent of Malbec that are in Argentina are like are, are different. Like they are genetically clonally different from what is being grown in France. Um, Malbec being grown in France. Um, is uh, like larger, generally has larger berries and looser clusters. Uh, Malbec being grown, the, mal the versions of Malbec grown in Argentina have um, smaller berries and tighter, denser clusters. Um, so they're like, they're really, they're different versions of Malbec. Um, uh, yeah, so, so like Malbec, has gone through these, like these waves of like being more common, you know, in Bordeaux and even prior to that, Malbec in Cahors. Cahors. Um, I actually, I'm going to go back to Cahors now. Cahors back in like the early early 1800s, like uh, I guess that would be like the Napoleonic era, like the end of the Napoleonic era. Um, Cahors was one of the largest wine producing regions in France. Uh, I want to say it was like 100,000 hectares of vines um, because it was a relatively easy place to grow grapes and they could export the wine down the lot. Cahors is this region that follows the Lot River. So they could export the wines by a boat down the Lot River to the Garonne, you know, which flows into Bordeaux and out through Bordeaux through the Gironde and then export it by boat to like northern France, to the Low Countries, 
to Britain, Germany, and stuff like that. So um, because that was before before railways. So Kaur was produced a ton of wine 200 years ago, um, but. Kaur was basically in direct competition with Bordeaux because Bordeaux was doing the same thing. They were producing wine and then shipping it to the low countries in Britain and stuff like that. And at some point, the you know the what's the like the 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 trope, the you know, like the 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 stupid sort of like idea is that like Kaur is like rural, rustic, agricultural farming France. And Bordeaux is this like mercantile, you know, like merchant traders, like the so Bordelais are much more hard nosed. And so at some point, the merchants and winemakers in Bordeaux were like, wait a minute, why are we letting these winemakers who are our, our competition in Caor, why are we letting them use our port to ship their wine, their customers? And so the Bordelais merchants, the, the city council in Bordeaux passed an ordinance barring the wines from Kaur from being shipped out of Kaur until like all the wines of Bordeaux had already been shipped out to customers. Um, so they didn't exactly close the port to Kaur, but Kaur couldn't get any of their wine out until the Bordeaux merchants had already shipped all their wine, you know, to the same customers. And so it gave them a huge competitive advantage, started the down the decline of Kaur, um, and then, I don't know, like 30, 40 years after that, then you had Phylloxera came to Europe and uh, came to Bordeaux first, and then but quickly made its way to Caor. Uh, Bordeaux had the money and resources to like suffer through it and keep on experimenting and finally, you know, figure out that you could uh, graft, um, graft vines onto North American rootstock. Uh, but Kaur didn't have the, reg the, uh, the resources that Bordeaux had. had. Um, so that hurt Kaur a lot. And, uh, you know, then is that just for, uh, advanced the decline of Kaur. And then you had like the World Wars and, um, and then that frost in 1956 and stuff. So Kaur has sort of like been in the wilderness for, for a long time. And just coming back now. Um, so it's cool that like Malbec has had this, you know, uh, this rebirth, this renaissance in Argentina that's brought like a lot more attention to it. But, uh, you know, popularity like that, like sudden intense popularity in, in anything that is like taste and culture, is sort of a double-edged sword, you know, like look at Merlot in California, Merlot become super popular and but then people get tired of it and move on to Pinot Noir a la the movie Sideways but then Pinot Noir is really difficult to grow and make inexpensive wines and so then people move on from inexpensive Pinot Noir in California so like Merlot, uh, Malbec, Argentine Malbec uh, is great for a lot of reasons but because Argentina is like an agricultural export country and Malbec in Argentina is very much produced for export. Like there isn't a huge domestic market. They're making wine would be sort of like trying to imagine what consumers in Germany or America or Britain would want to drink. Um, so they're not, a lot of winemakers, a lot of producers in Argentina are not necessarily making wines so that really taste like the place that they come from. They're trying to make wines that taste like what they think a German producer in like Baden-Württemberg thinks Malbec from Argentina should taste like. And that's complicated. And sometimes, you know, you, you end up with like a whole lot of wines that just taste the same, thanks to modern winemaking. Um, and also just because they haven't been like wine making traditions in Argentina, like they've been making wine for a really long time, but um, but Malbec and Malbec made like this is a is like um newer thing and they're still you know figuring out what what they want to be. Um, 
Yeah. But there's more and more cool stuff coming out of really out of everywhere. Um, just as the as the market has expanded and evolved and people's tastes have evolved and changed. And uh, I think I tried to pick out a good mix of different wines today that uh, that do all of that. So I'm going to jump into wine. Here we go. Um, I figured I'd just do this first because it's the oldest. And, uh, you know, like as wine gets older, usually it gets more delicate. So the first wine that we're drinking here is Chateau Lamartine Tower 2002. This is a 2002 Cahor. This is um, approximately 90% Malbec and 10% Merlot. Um, what do I know about this? Um, Chateau Lamartine has been in the same family since the Middle Ages. Uh, they are at the far western edge of Kaur. Kaur is this like long, squiggly Appalachian following the Lot River. So this is over in the far west. Um, it's actually the only part of Kaur, as far as I have been told, this is actually the only winery in Kaur that is actually influenced by the Atlantic. Now, all the whole rest of Kaur, further up the river valley, doesn't really get any influence from the Atlantic, but here, right at the very, very western edge, they do. Um, I so it's funny. I got this. All right. So all oh, oh also this is all terrace. The vineyards here are up on terraces facing south. Um, way back in the day, a hundred, hundred and fifty years ago, two hundred years ago. Most of the winemaking, most of the vineyards in Kaur were planted on like sandy uh, alluvial soil down by the river that were flatter, easier to work, and where the grapes ripened a little bit more easily, um, which probably made sense back then because it was colder. But now that the climate is warmer, um, a lot of the winemakers have moved their vineyards instead of farming down by the river, a lot of those vineyards have you know, now are like corn or like eggplants and stuff like that. Now, uh, a lot of the grape growing in Kaur is up on terraces uh, where it's a little bit cooler, it's a little bit windier, more exposed. The grapes take a little bit longer to ripen, but you get more, um, uh, more structure, more complexity. So that's, uh, so these vineyards now are up on, uh, on terraces looking south at the, um, the river. Uh, 2002 wasn't a particularly good special vintage or anything like that. Um, I just want to wound up having like a couple of extra cases of it. Uh, I don't know, 10 years ago or something like that. Uh, when like the new vintage was coming in. So like this was already on the older side. And so I was like, you know, I'll just hold on to these two cases of 2002 Cowar. And it wasn't even that good back then. It was kind of like lean and thin tasting, but I was like, why not? I've got it, I'll hold on to it and start to build a vertical of Calor. So I actually have a vertical of Chateau Lamartine Calor. I have a whole bunch of different vintages floating around uh, in the warehouse, but figured I'd get this out. So 90% Malbec, 10% Merlot. It smells, it's like aromatic, spicy, a little winter greeny. Peppery. Yeah, it's like it's it's like winter greeny, piney, currency. Like small, like 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 wild, wild, like Maine blueberries. Hmm. Hmm. 
Wow. It's on the rich side to me. Like it's like it tastes richer than I remember this tasting the last time I drank it, which must have been five or six years ago or something like that. Malbec Kaur uh, has this reputation. People talk about the black wine of Kaur, that traditionally Kaur was really rustic and had like really long skin macerations, um, which you know gave it like a lot of pigment and a lot of tannin, and you had these like really intense, very tightly wound, structured red wines that needed a long time of aging to like really be drinkable and approachable. Um, they've gotten away from that now just through like modern winemaking techniques, you know, and like not having to do super long skin maceration, stuff like that. Um, but Kaur still, Kaur has this reputation of like wines that are, if, if they're made right, like serious Kaur has a reputation for being very age worthy. And like to me, this is pretty impressive that this is drinking so well, but this is this is just like Chateau Lamartine's entry level Kaur. This isn't actually something that they probably intended anybody to, to age for this long. And I just had it in my warehouse. But to me, this is drinking pretty pretty awesome for something that's you know almost 20 years old. It doesn't taste old to me. Um, this bottle at least like the acidity and the, the tannin, it doesn't fall apart at all. Just the tannin is much more relaxed than it was when this wine was young. But the fruit is still great. It's still like dark, peppery, cedary, like blackberry, a little bit, little bit of like wild blueberry on the finish. Um, I really like that. That's actually sort of a surprise point. I was kind of worried that that was going to be, uh, that that might be over the hill. But now, now we've got the, 2000, the 2016 Chateau La Martine. So basically the same wine, but uh, 14 years younger. I mean, the color is obviously completely different. The color is a lot like more red, black in the glass. And I can smell some oak on the aroma, like not a, not a lot, but there's definitely a little bit of like, it's currency. More, more obviously more juicy fruit to it. But there's also something that smells a little bit like oak to me. The finish is actually really similar to me. Like the flavors of the, the finish, like I get some of the same like spicy, peppery, cedary, like a little hint of like the winter green thing. Um, the 2002 had it more in a more pronounced way, um, but it's like it's a very similar profile. A little bit more acidity, a little bit tighter, but it's still very drinkable and approachable right now. Um, the 2016 tastes a lot more approachable than I remember. The 2002 tasting when uh, when I had that you know way back when um, so I don't know if they've like slightly altered their winemaking process to like give it more you know more oxygen like maybe they transfer it more often something I don't know what but um, it's very similar just like more a little bit more approachable.
but that is like I think that is particularly this in 2016 like that's good a good representation example of Cal War and the 2002 is actually a really good representation of Cal War and like what Cal War was you know 20 30 years ago it was like slightly more rustic Bordeaux in a way it's like it's the same sort of like linear structure and like balance of acidity and tannin and like sort of tightly wound dark fruit that I get from Bordeaux as well. I forget where I was reading something that was saying like questioning like there's there's been a lot of investment into Cahor and I forget if it was uh the james robinson the wine app the hugh clark uh wine atlas or what but he was saying it was like questionable like whether all this investment in cowar was a good idea or not but you know that 2002 cowar was really nice i can see i can see why people would invest money in cowar to make cool wines like that for a, a fraction of the cost of bordeaux so all right so there's cowar now we are going to shoot north to the Loire Valley for this Pierre Olivier Bonhomme in Cote Wood Trust. So this is Cote. This comes from a little tiny single vineyard that Pierre Olivier Bonhomme bought uh, in Lorraine. And let's see, I'm gonna go to screen share here and where, was... don't tell me I lost it. Oh, there we go. So Pierre-Olivier Bonhomme, that guy, <clears throat> um, Pierre-Olivier Bonhomme, I'll start with this. Okay, so these are 45-year-old vines on like very typical soil, uh, limestone, uh, clay with a limestone base uh, here in Touraine. Um, single small parcel. This is whole cluster. So this is fermented with the skin. So I haven't smelled it yet. I haven't tasted it, but there should be like a tannic presence from the uh, the stem in here, like that should add a little bit more tannin, a little bit more green tannin to the wine. Um, fifteen day ferment, fifteen day fermentation, which is not super long, but then eighteen months in five hundred liter oak demi brut, and and this is also this is the zero sulfur wine. Um, Pierre Olivier Bonhomme uh, was an apprentice or uh, protege, call it what you will, <clears throat> uh, this guy, Thierry Puzelat, who, uh, who is the winemaker at um, Claude de Toubouf. Uh, Claude de Toubouf is a legendary producer in Cheverny um, that their family has held on to a lot of like old traditional varietals and um, like heritage clones of varietals. Like they have prop they've continued to propagate their vineyards using mothal selection instead of like buying vines and clones from winery supply companies. So they have a lot of like traditional, not just great varieties, but also like versions of those great varieties instead of like modern, like purposeful fully bred clones. Um, Claude de both like was, you know, uh, Claude de both I believe Terry Puzlot was one of, one of the founding members of the natural, the, I forget what the name of it is, but like the, the Association of Natural Winemakers in France back in the, whenever that was, like 70s or 80s. Um, so anyway, so Terry, so uh, Terry Puzlot, uh, his family's winery Claude de Toubouf, uh, at a point there were a bunch of very small, very poor vin vintages in the Loire. And so he started a separate winery. In, in France, you can't have a winery and both like make wine from your own 
vineyards and then also buy fruit from other vineyards and have them all in the same winery, uh, particularly if they're different appellations, you have to have two separate wineries. So Jerry Pouzelot started a separate winery specifically to buy grapes from other farmers so that he could make wine because he didn't have grapes to make wine from. So he started this other winery um, and then he got too busy with that between Clos de Tabouf and the new winery. And then I think he opened a wine bar. I think that that's the I think that's the wine bar. So he started a wine bar and then he was too busy to do everything. And so he was like, how am I going to do everything? And he uh, at some point, Pierre Olivier Bonhomme has like worked as an, uh, an intern with him. And uh, I don't know, they got back in touch or he heard that like Pierre Olivier Bonhomme had like dropped out of high school and stuff and like was you know looking for work. So they got together. And he brought Pierre Olivier Bonhomme into the like the Negos winemaking project that he was doing and started working together. And then eventually uh, just like transferred, sold the winery to Pierre Olivier Bonhomme so he could just go back and focus on his family's winery, quote it to a book. And Pierre Olivier Bonhomme like took over this winery that he and Pierre Pouzelot had sort of started and gotten off the ground together. So um, so he really like learned with Pierre Pouzelot. Um, you know, who I'll say it again is a like really important legendary winemaker in France and in the natural winemaking world. Um, so this is Pierre Olivier Bonhomme Malbec from 2017. It has this freshness, this like floral aromatic quality that's gorgeous, and that also I 100% associate with um, Malbec from the Loire Valley, and also really with like Thierry Pouzelot and Pierre Olivier Bonhomme's wine. Um, I don't know why or like what it is that they're doing, but their wines are like really beautifully aromatic and, and floral. And I think, I think some of it also, like I wouldn't, I haven't tasted it yet, but because it's like totally natural because it's wild yeast fermentation and it's not really temperature controlled and there's no sulfur added. I think there's a tiny bit of like volatile acidity here that you don't really pick up on that you're not like, oh, that's volatile acidity, but it like gives the wine a little bit more of like a wild vivid intensity to the aromatic. Yeah, it's it's floral, it's like high toned violet, raspberries, like super fresh raspberries. And then on the palate, I wouldn't call it tight, but it's like dense, like the the texture of the wine is like has a lot of density to it and there's this tannin that's not aggressive but is sort of there from the mid palate through the finish and like drives my palate out a little bit all like all the way through i mean to me it tastes sort of blueberry Like mostly blueberry fruit, but there's other stuff going on, like sort of a, like a little bit of a raspberry. And there's a herbaceous quality too that I can't quite put my finger on because I'm bad at herbs that are not like standard basic Provencal herbs. They eat a lot of rosemary and thyme and stuff like that. And this is not rosemary and thyme. But there is this like slightly peppery herbaceous thing in the mid palate of the wine that is, it's just like a little vein of it in behind the fruit and with the tannin and the acidity. I like that a lot. That's really vivid and fun. And like that's Malbec. And that was completely different from Cahors. 
totally different expression of Malbec from Calor. Well, that's like that that like cold clay and then cold limestone subsoil in the Loire and colder temperatures and and all of that. It's definitely like a less phenolically ripe, a less less ripe, still phenolically ripe, but like less sugar content, less ripe wine. Um, cool. All right, now where was I going? Number four, so now going on to Argentina. So now I've got, I will, uh, actually I can just go over here. Zorzal. Let me make this go, yeah, there we go. Zorzal Malbec. Um, this is a product uh, project of the Michelini brothers, Michelini brothers, I think. Um, these three brothers, the Michelini family, they've been active. They've been they've been in the winemaking industry, winemaking business in Argentina for I, I don't know for a long time. Uh, their their family has, and so then these three brothers sort of like grew up uh, in the family wine business, wine industry and stuff. And um, they have little vineyards all over around Argentina um, in like a bunch of different terroirs doing different things. Like they do make a, you know, Malbec like this, but they're also doing a lot of sort of like a lot of other great varieties, interesting blends. And I want to say they actually, they have a winery in maybe in Galicia now too, or like in Bierzo uh, in Europe. Anyway, so, um, so this is the Gualpilari subregion of the Uco Valley, so which is and the and the Uco Valley is a subregion of Mendoza. So Mendoza is a huge, is a pretty huge place. Uh, I forget, I don't know exactly how big it is, but like from north to south, like Mendoza is got to be like a I don't know, a couple a hundred miles, hundred and fifty miles from north to south. Like Mendoza is a big area it's a big region with a lot of different subzones and different things there um so the michelini family the michelini brothers started this project the in 2007 um <clears throat> it's uh sort of an unusual terroir uh it's a like a, an alluvial mix of like stones and sand and granitic limestone and and all kinds of stuff. Um, you can see the uh, the Andes in the background there. And you can also you can just see how like dry and rocky the soil is. It's, 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 it is really sort of like high plateau, high desert here. Um, it's, so this is de-stemmed now where the coat was fermented whole cluster with the stems. This is de-stemmed and fermented with native yeast. And uh, I couldn't find, looking around online, I couldn't find like what this is aged in, but um, you know, I, it doesn't smell or taste like oak. I would be surprised if they're using a lot of oak for this because um, oak doesn't really grow in Argentina. So you have to like import barrels and oak wine barrels are really expensive. And it just, it just wouldn't make sense to like import a whole lot of really super expensive oak barrels to use for a wine like this. So this is probably more likely a lot of cement and stainless steel. And in one of those little pictures, it's right there in the center. You can see they've got a whole bunch of concrete eggs. Um, South America is pretty big, particularly like sort of like I don't know, winemakers that are looking to make interesting wines like this in South America, they are big on concrete. Because concrete has a lot of great things about it. So I won't get into that. This smells darker and denser than any of the French Malbec. More sort of jammy. Sort of jammy, but not like not as like big and fruit driven and or, or as like unctuous as um, uh, like quintessential Argentine 
small deck. But it's like ripe, juicy, blackberry, and it smells a little bit savory. It's a little bit spicy and peppery. But also, there's something that's more savory smelling to me. It has nice acidity on the palate. Um, I think to an extent you have the, the high elevation here to thank for that, the so like high elevation in the dry air. Um, it's not as tannic as any of the French Malbecs, which is uh, um, uh, like that, that Argentine Malbec in general has the reputation of not being as tannic as, um, as the French version of Malbec. But it has sort of that same nice, juicy, black raspberry fruit, brown, supple, um, particularly nice acidity. That's what sort of sets the wine apart for me and like makes this a, a cool and like, interesting, nice wine. Um, and then the finish actually has this really nice little like raspberry flavor that comes back like to me at, like after the after the finish and after the tannin. It's about the, I feel like it's about the same weight as the French Malbec. It's just like a slightly different balance of the flavors and like what drives the wine is a little bit different. It just doesn't quite have like the structure that the French do, but it's really, or that those French wines did, but it's really nice and really enjoyable. Wine number five, this is another. Well, they're all Argentine Malbecs from here on out. Uh, this is Alpamanta Natal. Uh, let's see. This is let me see. This is 2018. All right, cool. Both of these, the Alpamanta Natal and the Zorzal, these are both 2018. So they're the same vintage, but the uh, the Natal looks a lot darker in my glass. And where we go, Alpamanta. Alpamanta is a winery down in southern Mendoza, um, run by that guy, Andre um, who, geez, I actually, I don't even know where he was originally from. I want to say he was Swiss, but his family, he had moved around as a kid. He moved around Europe. Um, he moved to Argentina in the late 90s to do sales for a software company. Um, but then the Argentine debt crisis happened, and so the software company he was working for it was like a business services software company and they were like yep we're just pulling the plug on our Argentine operation come home and he was like actually I'm going to stay here um, so he stayed in Argentina uh, he'd fallen in love he got married and he'd also just fallen in love with the place and with wine and so he like looking around back particularly back then in like the late 90s um, he felt like nobody was making like really serious like interesting wine that really like just tasted like the place like the wine a lot of the winemaking that was happening in Argentina to him back in the 90s was like making wine for export making wine to taste the way that someone else wanted the wines to taste so um he thought that he saw an opportunity to do that and he was really he had gotten really passionate about wine so he, um, a cousin and a friend, bought 35 hectares in southern Mendoza, like really just in the middle of nowhere, um, and slowly, slowly, like planted vines, you know, like built buildings, built a winery. Um, 
it had been a farm at some point, but it had been abandoned for decades. So pretty much everything was gone. But there were permits to have a well, which was a really big deal. So they had to re like re dig, rebuild the well, but they had permits to do that. Um, Alpamonta was and is the first winery in Argentina to be certified biodynamic. Um, that was something that was really important to him. Um, I believe this is actually mixing one of the biodynamic preparations for uh, putting on the vines, uh, composting, burying horns, another part of biodynamic uh, farming, burying horns from milking cattle with, I forget what preparation it is in it, but yeah, more biodynamic farming. Um, so uh, this is certified organic, certified biodynamic, uh, de-stemmed, and uh, this is aged in stainless steel for 10 months. So where uh, the, like the coat from the Loire was aged for 18 months, this was just 10 months and exclusively in stainless steel. And it's a lot darker, actually. I want to go back and look at that. Um, uh, unfined. Yeah, this is unfined and unfiltered as well. No. It just it smells brighter. It smells like brighter and fresher and sort of like more focused and, uh, and a little bit more tart. more like blueberry and a little bit of raspberry, a little bit of cherry. It also has a little bit of that like peppery wintergreen sort of thing. Hmm. But it is ripe on the palate. It's pretty sleek, uh, like the other wines were. Uh, like it's pretty like classic Malbec, like sleek and supple. Um, but uh, a little bit more acidity, like it's a little bit fresher steaming to me. But then, so I get that like like fresh fruit up front, and then on the mid palate, it's a little bit more savory and a little bit sort of like chocolatey, like baking chocolate. It dries out, the tannin comes in, and you get these substantial tannins. Like this, this wine to me has always seemed more European. Like it has more acidic and tannic structure that like defines the wine and carries all of the flavors um, sort of in comparison to some of the other like Argentine Malbec or what Argentine Malbec classically have. Um, this is at like a thousand feet less elevation compared to the Zorzal Malbec. The Zorzal was like 4,200 feet of elevation and this is like just over 3,000 feet of elevation. Um, Andre has actually come and visited Maine a couple of times. And uh, I just remember stories from him of like trying to deal with the Argentine government and how ridiculous it was. But, like they wouldn't let him export some of his wines because they didn't think they were very good. Like they were just too weird. Like he'd made like an unfiltered, like skin fermented, like Sauvignon Blanc, you know? And so it was just like cloudy you know, like white wine, and they were like, what is this? Like, this isn't wine. We're not going to let you export this. Um, and where he is, he's like, his vineyard is so out in the middle of nowhere that like in the rainy season, like when they do get rain or when there's a lot of like, you know, snow melt from the mountains, sometimes the, the dirt road to his winery. He, you, he said that you basically, you take the highway until the highway ends 
and then you drive on these little rural dirt roads to eventually get to where his winery is. And sometimes they just flood, and then he can't get, he can't leave. He's just there at the at the winery until uh, until the waters go down. All right, last up, this is Finca Adalgisa, 2013, Luan de Coyo. <laughs> um, so this is really cool, but also really unusual. This is actually like a really, if, if I was trying to do a, a class or a seminar and just like talk about like what Argent, what Malbec and what, what specifically Argentine Malbec is like, it'd be like, here is classic Argentine Malbec. This would be a terrible wine to use for a seminar like that um, because this is not at all normal Argentine Malbec. So these vines are over 100 years old. These vines were planted in 1916. It's a uh, slightly less than two hectares. It's like 1.8 hectares, uh, 1. 1. 1. No, 1.8 acres. It's like 0. 0.85 hectares. So it's a tiny little vineyard that's been in the Ferlati family for three generations. They, they planted it back in 1916. Um, it's uh, it has been, oh, it's been um, farmed basically organically. It's been farmed like not with uh, chemical pesticides or fertilizers for that entire time. They just sort of like had it as like a little family vineyard and they just sold the grapes off until, I'm not sure when, I won't, it was like 2000 or just like 2001 or two, something like that. They've been selling the grapes off and um, the, I forgot her name, the third generation, uh, but this, uh, this, you know, woman matriarch, you know, this woman took over the, the family like vineyard here and she built a little tiny um, like boutique hotel. And, um, you know, it was like, boy, we have this vineyard that's practically a hundred years old and we're just selling the great off. It sure would be like, Maybe we should do something else with the, this, this cool little vineyard and these vines. It would be cool to make wine here and then like have the wine at, at my boutique hotel. Um, and she talked to this winemaker, Carmelo Pati, who um, is a sort of legendary winemaker in Argentina. Um, he's made wine for a lot of the like most famous wineries in Argentina. He's also made wine for a lot of wineries in Europe. Um, he grew up in Argentina. He was actually born in Sicily, uh, but I think his family moved to Argentina when he was like four or five, something like that. <clears throat> but um, he went to work in wine and he's basically like been a winemaker for his entire life. I don't know how old he is now, like 70 or something like that or in the 60s. Um, but so He's this like really famous winemaker in Argentina. And she contacted him and was like, hey, I have this hundred year old vineyard. It would be, I would love if you would, you know, come and make make a wine from it. This is the only wine they make, I should say. Um, and he was like, I don't have time for this. I am I am way too uh, too busy. I don't, I don't, I don't think I have time to like come and mess around with your tiny little vineyard. Um, there he is. Uh, and but then he actually came and like looked at the vineyard and fell in love with the vineyard and decided that he just he was like sure why not I'll I'll do this I should take on this project and you know one of his um, uh, one of his requirements was that he just have complete and total control over like how the wine would be made and stuff like that so he makes this wine totally traditionally it's farmed organically, it's not certified, but he's just like very, very, very traditional. Everything is done manually. Um, uh, the wine is fermented with native yeast fermentation because like that's, you know, how you traditionally did it. That's how he learned how to make wine uh, when he was studying in Italy. Uh, and then this is aged in bottle until it's ready to drink, until he feels like it's ready to drink. 
Yeah, I can't actually, I don't know what this actually, anyway. <clears throat> uh, so 2013 is the current vintage. Uh, and they make about 500 cases per year. So it's a tiny, tiny production, um, you know, project that's not, like it's not really a commercially like viable, like it's not a it's not a big deal, but it's a really cool um, expression of what Malbec can do uh, in Argentina. So 3,000 feet of elevation, about the same as uh, the Natal. Uh, but this is aged in a mix of French and American oak. And like the like on the college bottled, um, unfined and unfiltered. Um, I don't actually get a ton of fruit from it. It's not a super like aromatic red wine. It's sort of more of like a like a relaxed, like elegant, like dried cherries, sort of herbal, like a little like a little bit of pine to it. I think some of that is coming from it's got to be like old neutral oak barrels because it and this wine has always like in a way sort of reminded me of like old school Brunello de Montalcino and stuff like that. Not in the weight of it and not in the profile of the taste, but like a little bit in the aromatics, which like to an extent are influenced by that time in oak barrels. It's just hard to compare this to the other, like all the other wines that were here. This is a, another very different expression of Malbec. Um, it has tannin. It probably, like it might have more tannin than the Natal or the Zorzal, but it has so much more fruit and ripeness. And there's, like, it's not a sweet wine at all, but I think there is a tiny bit more sweetness left to this wine, which just makes it taste and present as like a rounder, juicier, more lush red wine, um, which has the effect of like covering and clothing like the tannins that it's got. So the tannins are there and you do sort of feel them on the palate, but you don't perceive the tannins like as aggressively as the tannins in the Zorzal and the Natal came across because the tannins were just more obvious in the, the Natal Malbec. It's a very different profile of flavors because of its age and because of the time in barrel. These are older barrels that aren't giving a whole lot of flavor to the wine. It's not a direct relationship like that. Like there is X flavor that comes from the barrel. Um, but the wine spending time in barrel, you know, in a vessel that's permeable and lets in a little bit of air and stuff like that, like that allows the wine to age differently and evolve in a different direction and develop some of these more like these savory flavors that wouldn't that, that would have been hidden that just wouldn't have emerged yet if it had been aged in stainless steel for a while or if it if it wasn't this old. It's a little bit more like rambly and chocolatey and I love this description, a tiny bit like a pussy roll, um, you know, obviously not in like a really sweet way, but it has that like, like dark sort of like, like chewy, juicy sort of like flavor that that pussy roll has a little bit. Um, it's a really, really cool, complex like expression of Malbec. It's totally different from, you know, pr pretty much every other Malbec I think I've ever had from Argentina. This is 
really different. Um, but shows what like what you can do in Argentina and like as winemaking in Argentina continues to develop. You know, who knows what we'll see. Um, so that's my I think that's my that's it. That's my Malbec seminar. Um, I guess the takeaway that I have from it is just that gee, Malbec does a whole lot of very different things <laughs> depending on where you grow it. And uh, you know, the, 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 some of this also comes down to the, like these are different clonal versions of Malbec. So you have like different versions of Malbec being grown in very different climates. But even in France, that difference between Caor and Loire, the coat from Touraine, like those were very different. And then all of the Argentine Malbec, again, were very different. So <clears throat> Malbec is an interesting grape. It gets pigeonholed as like easy drinking, juicy, like medium bodied red wine. And these were all medium bodied and they were all kind of juicy, but then beyond that, they went in a lot of different directions. Um, so I hope that helps. I hope that gave you like a, you know, a, a, an idea of like how broad Malbec is. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for watching. Um, next week, I am going to do the Jura. It's going to be crazy because I have got among various different things from the Jura. I got a bunch of Van Jean from uh, Cav Bordy. So 2009 Van Jean for next week. Um, thanks a lot. I hope you all had a great time. Have a good afternoon. I'll see you later. Bye.